So this is um, John 12, verse 1 to 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given to Jesus, given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Thank you, Leah. Good to be here today and hear the good things that God is doing. And I want to speak this morning on the subject of carrying the fragrance of Jesus. Wherever we are, that's based on the lovely story that Leah has just read. By way of introduction, just a couple of months ago, Paul and I were enjoying a lovely 50th wedding anniversary celebration. It was happened during COVID, but we weren't able to enjoy this. It was a gift from our children and our grandchildren, and it was a gift to a perfume studio where I could create my own perfume and Paul could create his own aftershave, and we did just that. So we were testing samples of spices and lovely fragrances, putting them together, top notes, middle notes, base notes, until we created our perfect perfume. And the end product was lovely. So I have my own perfume here, which I've romantically called Romance in Spring. It just reminded me of that. And I don't know what Paul called his aftershave. But it's there on file now for us to buy whenever we want. But that was all included in the price. And you know, it's nice when you wear something lovely to smell, isn't it? It's a lovely to have a lovely smell. When people say, what's that perfume you're wearing? That's really lovely to, to experience. It's nice to smell nice. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 to 16 tells us this. For we are to God the, the pleasing aroma of Christ amongst those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death to the other an aroma that brings life. The Apostle Paul declared to us, uh, we know that we know that we know Jesus and we love him and therefore we carry a particular fragrance of life to people wherever we go. So we have this fragrance that we carry that has the power to bring life to people, this wonderful fragrance. And the story in John 12 is about a woman who does just that. She anoints Jesus uh, with a beautiful aroma that la lasted all day. And Jesus had raised previously in the previous chapter Lazarus from the dead, and so this dinner was given in honor of Jesus. There would have been lots of people there. There would have been uh, their friends and neighbors, Jesus and his disciples. It was a patriarchal society at that time, very much a man's world, and women were expected to be in the background, preparing food, serving people, bringing the food out, waiting on the men. But what this lady did was incredible because she came forward and she did something that astounded the people that were there. And the first thing we note about this story is Mary's expensive gift. It was a very costly gift that she brought. It wasn't cheap. I'll give you some background about the essence of nard which was the ointment that she brought out. Um, it's a fragrant, aromatic ointment that comes from wild plants that are only found in certain places, China, India, uh, Himalayas, in Nepal. So it's costly to find, it's costly to extract the oil, 
costly to impart this fragrance. And so the onlookers at this meal would have considered this an extravagance to actually use this ointment on the feet of Jesus at a supper. They didn't understand what she was doing. They thought it was an inappropriate waste of money, and so did Jesus, and he complained about it. He said, this is nearly a year's wages, because at that time, in Roman times, um, you earned a penny a day, and this fragrance could have cost more than 300 pence. So you can see it was nearly a year's wages wasted, they thought, on the feet of Jesus. However, there's a sense here that Mary was anointing Jesus in readiness for his death and his burial. So her significant role was simply to Jesus at that time. She was focusing on Jesus, and it was, she was providing an anointing that was a prophetic symbol of what was to come in a week's time, because the Passover was coming, and then Jesus would be crucified and buried. Not only did she provide this prophetic symbol that the scriptures tells us about, but she was publicly declaring her own personal worship of Jesus. What was personal in her heart, the fact that she knew Jesus, she knew he was the way, the truth, and the life, he was her savior, he was a messiah, she was now publicly declaring that for all these men to see. And by pouring this expensive ointment on his feet, it was symbolizing her act of selfless devotion to, to Jesus. She wasn't considering the cost. This was her worship of the Lord. And I want to ask us today, what are we willing to give to the Lord that might be costly to us? Do we give him our whole of our lives without reservation? Do we hold anything back and say, Lord, that belongs to me, you can't touch that? Does this include our future hopes and dreams, our aspirations, our thoughts and desires? Are we willing to offer him our homes, our possessions, our finances, or do we think that these things belong to us? What about our time and energy? What about the hours in the day? How much are we willing to give to Jesus? Jesus came, you know, to bring us abundant life. We know that and we testify to that fact. But there are many people out there in the world that do not know Jesus. They haven't tasted of this life. We only have one life to live. Therefore, we need to give this one life to Jesus. It passes so quickly. It doesn't seem two minutes since I was a child of eight and gave my life to Jesus. It doesn't seem two minutes since I went to Bible college with Paul in 71. And I'm now in my 70s, but time passes quickly. We need to give all the time we can to Jesus. We only have one life. So just like Mary, our lives need to be a daily act of worship. I'm not talking about the songs we sing. We've had great worship this morning. Thank you, ladies and guys, for leading us. That's been great. It's not just about that. It's about how we live our lives every single day, the things we say, the things we do, how we communicate Jesus to people. That is our daily act of worship. I wonder what our love and worship looks like to the world we inhabit. What do the public think about our worship of Jesus? Do our unsaved friends and colleagues and family members who's, who see that we say, I'm a Christian, do they see that that person is a Christian carrying the fragrance of Jesus? Or are they confused if we act in a totally inappropriate way? We can make mistakes at times. Does our private confession of Christ match up to our public speech and behavior. Mary poured very expensive perfume on the feet of Jesus and it spoke volumes to the people around her. So people are going to observe us. They're going to see what our life is really like, what our true worship of Jesus looks like. Now, we don't only see that this was a costly gift that she was willing to put on the feet, feet of Jesus, but we actually see, secondly, her humble attitude because her focus was totally on Jesus this was about Jesus this was not about the people around her she had to kneel down at the feet of Jesus in the servant's pose to do this act and yet she was a friend of Jesus we know they were friends they talked together they ate together they communed together many times but she was willing to get down on her hands and knees to anoint his feet the lowest of the low place 
wiping away all the dirt and the dust from his feet. And then instead of grabbing for a towel or asking a servant for a towel, she bends even lower down to the ground and she uses her long tresses to wipe away, to smooth away this ointment on Jesus' feet. She chooses to stay in a kneeling position as she does this. So she was as low as she could possibly be in that kneeling position. But Mary was now carrying this fragrance on herself. She had it on her hands. She had it on her hair, on her face. Something very precious was happening here between Jesus and Mary as she anointed him. I want to ask you, how long are you willing to sit at the feet of Jesus to pick up his fragrance? How long am I willing to sit at the feet of Jesus to pick up his fragrance? I wonder how those dinner guests felt when they witnessed her act of love and humility. This was personal worship made public. They would have felt uncomfortable, I think. Some might have thought this is an extravagance. But I think some were touched by this act. Maybe they even gave to their lives to the Lord. This would impact them for the rest of their lives because they could smell this fragrance. They knew its worth and they knew what she was doing. She was hum humbling herself in order to promote and lift up and honor Jesus. She was willing to become low so that Jesus was lifted up high. Are we willing to lower ourselves and lower our status and, and the things we think about ourselves? Or maybe are we concerned about what people think about us when we testify? But are we willing to lower ourselves so that Jesus is promoted and lifted high? She sets us that wonderful example. You know, over years I've heard people say, this is my faith, it's a personal thing to me. I've heard it on the radio, I've heard friends say it. My personal Christian beliefs are personal to me. I don't have to share them with everybody. But I think Mary shows, shows us in this example that it's important that we let people know what we think of Jesus. And that's what she was doing here. Are you and I prepared to let our friends know of the faith that we put in Jesus? Or are we frightened to talk about it? Do we keep our beliefs very private? We've had situations where we've talked to neighbors and I've gone back home and thought, oh, why didn't I say something then? I've let you down, Lord. I should have spoken about you when I could have done. That door was open. We need to take all these doors, don't we? Push through them, share our faith. Are we willing to sacrifice our own egos and status at work by speaking out about Jesus when we have the opportunity? Are we willing to humbly accept the fact that we need to be able to share our faith with others so that they can know him, even if they scoff at us, even if they laugh. Now, Mary's act of anointing wasn't a quick thing. It wasn't over in a minute. The very fact that she anointed him with a perfume and she wiped his feet, and then she, you know, anointed him and then wiped his feet with her hair. This would have taken time from start to finish. And I'm thinking, what can we learn from her actions? I think we should be taking the time to honor Jesus every single day in our personal lives. So we need to spend time with him, talking to him, listening to him, praying, reading his word, getting familiar with this Jesus that Mary knows. Do our unsaved friends and colleagues know that we're committed to Jesus? Do our family members know that we love Jesus, that he's the Messiah in our lives, that he's saved us? Are they able to smell this beautiful fragrance on us? The Bible tells us that Jesus lives within us. So not only does he transform us from the inside, but outside we carry something. So I believe Jesus makes us beautiful. That lovely story, um, letter that Pam read, it explains that. What we think is ugly, Jesus transforms into beautiful. So uh, this beautiful fragrance we carry beautifies us from within. And I believe it tells a story to people. Mary's gift used all of her creative instincts. What she did was a creative act of worship when she publicly anointed Jesus. I believe we should use our creative gifts 
to glorify Jesus and to worship him because he's given every single one of us talents and gifts. You do not have the same gifts that I have and I don't have the same you have. We are all different. God has given us all gifts and talents that we can use for him. You just need to know what those giftings are and then use them for his glory, whatever they may be. So it was an expensive gift that she lay at the feet of Jesus. It was a humble attitude, that of serving Jesus that we see demonstrated here. But we also see the fruit of her worship. Because fruit of worship will always result in a fruit. It will all, that the, the, our worship is what I'm trying to say. Our true worship will always bear fruit. So when we worship Jesus, when we live a life that's full of him, when we share our faith about him, it's going to bear fruit. We are going to see fruit in our daily lives. And we are going to see people filling this place because that's the fruit of Jesus. And verse 3 says here that when Mary had finished her act of worship, the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. I love that phrase, the house was filled. It wasn't just that room where she was sitting and where the guys were sitting, but the whole house was filled. So the aroma lingered upon the body of Jesus. It lingered on Mary's hair and hands and feet as she walked around on her clothing. It lingered on the clothes of the guests as they left, even after they left and went home. It lingered on the bodies of the servants as they prepared food that evening. It lingered upon the disciples as they sat next to Jesus. The wonderful aroma wafted out of the house, down the street, and I think it went into open doors. That aroma went into open doors. And I guess when the guests came home, the wives were saying, where has this aroma come from? And they were able to tell, tell them, this is what's happened tonight. I have seen something amazing, and I'm carrying the fragrance on me. So Mary's one act affected a whole house full of people that night. And it would have gone on to impact many more as the news spread because her presence in the room couldn't be missed. She carried it around with her. I wonder how many people became Christians that night. You know, the story goes on in John 12 that Leah read that the chief priest decided to kill Jesus and Lazarus because he'd been raised from the dead because too many people were following Jesus. So I think that the consequences of her genuine worship that night affected more than just herself affected more than the people in that room. It affected many, many more who heard this story and began to think. So I want to ask you, are you and I carrying the fragrance of Jesus in our lives every day? Is it there lingering on our clothes, on our person? Do we carry his presence and anointing when we leave this place? Do we touch the lives of people in Stanmore when we happen to meet them? Do they know about the Jesus that we sing about in here? What about when we're with our families and unsaved friends and colleagues? Is his presence and anointing noticed by them? Do they smell that fragrance on us? It's the fragrance of Jesus. So our true act of worship, living for Jesus, will produce fruit. Let me tell you, it will. I could tell you lots of stories. I haven't got time to tell you this morning of the times I've done door knocking, the times I've walked down the streets, and people have wanted to know about Jesus. And people have come to know Jesus. I'm not going to take time telling you today, but we can all have stories like that. It will result in fruit in people's lives. Jesus said, if we believe and abide in him, then we are like branches abiding in the vine, and he will produce fruit through those branches, we will be a witness for him and see others saved. The Bible also tells us we are the temple and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. So we carry within us that beautiful fragrance and we carry it on ourselves as we move amongst people. Many years ago, um, I wrote a very simple worship song about my offering my love and devotion to Jesus. And we, it was sung in our church for quite a few years. And I think this song might reflect your own thoughts. And I'll just read them to you. These were the words, Lord, I open my alabaster box of love for you. I will wash your feet with my tears. 
I anoint your head with the fragrance of my love, for I worship you, Lord. Yes, I love you, O Lord. I'll lay down my life, O Lord, at your feet. I'll bring to you, Lord, the praises of my heart, for you have forgiven all my sin. You gave me new life, and now I want to say that I worship you, Lord. Yes, I love you, Lord, for you are my king and my God. Now, in conclusion, I just want to tell you about a rather beautiful process, a natural process that takes place in our seas and our oceans. It's about a creation of a rare product called ambergris. I guess you might have heard of it. It's produced by sperm whales. Only about 1% of these whales will um, manufacture it. Sperm whales eat lots of squid. And usually they pass through four stomachs and it's slowly digested. But squid beaks are not digestible. And if they don't vomit up the squid beaks, which are really hard and uncrunchable, then they can become congested in the fourth stomach and form this huge mass, indigestible mass, which is called ambergris. Consequently, those particular sperm whales that don't dig uh, digest it will uh, suffer a fatal intestinal rupture and they die. And when they die, the seagulls and the sharks come and devour the remains and they throw open the contents and the contents of the inner stomach are laid bare on the ocean. And it's this ambergris, which is a smelly, pungent thing, uh, lies on the water. But over many decades, this mass of ambergris starts to develop and change and mature. And over many years, it's washed up on different beach beaches, but the pungent smell has now gone because something's happened to it in the process of being in the sea. It now is sweet and woody smelling. And when it was discovered, it became a much sought after component of the perfume industry. So probably a bit of whale stuff in there. And um, uh, also it was used medicinally and as a spice. But the interesting thing about this creation is, and I've made a note of it, sperm whales spend most of their time, their lives in the dark, in the depths of the ocean. However, when the ambergris is released upon the ocean waves, it comes into contact with salt and light, and it experiences tempests and storms which toss it around. All of the conditions here imposed upon the ambergris turns it radically into a mature and highly prized commodity. But the whale has to die first before the fragrance of the ambergris is noted and received and produced. So as I end, we come from a dark place, don't we? Before we know Jesus, we're from a dark place. We can't help ourselves. But when we die to ourselves and let the light of Jesus come into our life, then we pass from death to life. We will go through storms and tempest that shake us up, storms of life, the seas of life, but it will cause us to change for the better, producing a beautiful fragrance. And I believe people will be attracted to us because of Jesus living in us. We carry his fragrance in our lives. In Exodus 30, we are told about the mixing of fragrant spices for use in the temple for the sacrifices, for the incense, etc. And it involved grinding everything into a fine powder to be able to be used. By doing this, a, a beautiful fragrance was created for the incense in the temple. We should allow the Lord to grind out every impurity in our life so that we can become the aroma of Christ wherever we go. 2 Corinthians 2.14 said, God uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. Jesus set the supreme example for us, didn't he, when he lived and he died for us. Ephesians 5.2 says, live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and he offered himself as a sacrifice for us, and as a pleasing aroma to God. 
So finally, as I end, what about New Life Church? I'm giving you some questions here to think about, maybe for next life group. Does this church body carry the sweet aroma of the presence of Jesus when it meets together as a family? Does it take that fragrance outside of this building? Do we take it into the lives of people that we meet either around here or in our own communities? Are people in Stanmore getting to know about this fragrance? Is it wafting through those doors and going up the street and down the street? Let's be willing to offer our lives totally to him and carry this fragrance and this sweet aroma wherever we go. Because somebody said it this morning, I don't know where I've heard it, but we need to recognize and declare we are his hands, his feet, feet and his voice. We also have now become the fragrance of Jesus. So that's beautiful, isn't it? So let's give him this costly gift of our worship, our personal worship. Humbly offer him and serve him with all our hearts. And just like Mary did, I believe we are going to see much fruit produced not only in our personal lives, but in the life of this church. So what fragrance are you carrying on you today? God bless you.